If it's Monday, new candidates and new scrutiny as another Republican presidential hopeful jumps into the race, someone else says he's out and sounds the alarm about the number of candidates in this still growing field. Plus, first to NBC, the federal grand jury investigating Trump's handling of classified documents is expected to meet this week as the former president's lawyer met today with officials at the Justice Department. And close encounters, the military releases new footage capturing the moment a Chinese warship sailed directly into the path of a U.S. Navy destroyer, just days after another close call with Chinese military in the skies. Hello and welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Ryan Nobles in for Kristen Welker, coming to you at the start of a busy week on the Republican presidential campaign trail with one more candidate now officially in the field and more expected this week. Former Vice President Mike Pence filed paperwork with the FEC for a presidential run ahead of an expected announcement Wednesday. And former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie is expected to throw his hat in tomorrow. And North Dakota's governor, Doug Burgum, is also expected to get in on Wednesday. They're joining an already crowded field of candidates, all of them taking on the front runner, the former president, Donald Trump. By the end of this week, the primary field will go all the way to 11. It is reminiscent of the large and fractured field that Trump successfully bested to win the nomination in 2016. But one Republican came today came forward with his deep concerns about the size of the field, and that's New Hampshire's Governor Chris Sununu. He announced he's not going to run for president and will instead stay on the sidelines doing all he can to prevent Mr. Trump from winning the nomination. Sununu writes in an op-ed, quote, Our party is on a collision course toward electoral irrelevance without significant corrective action. The stakes are too high for a crowded field to hand the nomination to a candidate who earns just 35% of the vote, and I will help ensure this does not happen. Sununu also urged the candidates in the race to confront Trump directly, something we have started to see more and more of in recent days, a stark contrast from just a month ago. Mike Pence, Ron DeSantis, and Nikki Haley all condemned Trump's recent praise of North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. I was surprised to see that. I mean, I think, one, Kim Jong-un is a murderous dictator. Whether it's my former running mate or anyone else, no one should be praising uh, the dictator in North Korea or or praising uh, the, uh, the, the, the leader of Russia. Kim Jong-un is a thug. There's nothing good or decent about Kim Jong-un. This weekend, we also saw DeSantis taking aim at Trump's claim that he could fix the country in six months while Haley continues to criticize Trump's view of the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Don't let anyone tell you they can do this in 24 hours or in six months or anything like that. Uh, this is going to be trench warfare. you got to understand how to use the levers of power. Uh, we pledge to do that. He thinks it was a beautiful day. I think it was a terrible day. I'll always stand by that. Well, despite the warning from Sununu and the possibility that the former president could be indicted by the special counsel any day now, the Republican field keeps getting bigger, and the chances of anyone beating Trump to the nomination seem to be getting smaller. Joining me now is my NBC News colleague, Vaughn Hilliard, who just got back from his second favorite home, Iowa, where he spent some time with the Republican presidential field. Uh, so, Vaughn, Sununu staying out of the race, I think maybe a bit of a surprise to those of us that have been tracking it. But okay. what was the big surprise was how declarative he was in sounding the alarm that Trump can't win in 2024. Uh, are Republican voters listening, especially you talked to so many of them in Iowa this week? Right. First of all, there's a receptiveness to candidates here, and folks are not pushing back against having choices. People generally like choices, and that is what is being given to them. And that's why at a catacall event like we saw on Saturday when the entire Republican field except for Donald Trump were there, they got to spend a whole afternoon listening to all of these candidates deliver 10-minute stump speeches. And there's nobody, Ryan, I think that is galvanizing a movement at this point, much like eight years ago, right? We were picking up on folks saying, we want Bernie 
Bernie Sanders. We want Bernie Sanders, which led all of us to be like, Hillary Clinton has a real challenger. This time around, it's not like you're meeting decisive DeSantis, DeSantis, or Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley. But I talked to a great many folks who said that there's several of the candidates they like and they want to keep listening, which suggests that it is not declaratively going to be Trump this go around, that there is competition. But when you have that diluted field, is there going to be anybody that is going to be able to create a political movement out of some of that support? So what is Trump World saying about the Sununu op-ed? You know, for uh, Sununu here at this point, we should n note that Donald Trump is working on a campaign track as well as an investigations lawyer track. Right now, today, his focus on his social media account was very much the legal uh, end uh, of which his lawyer is meeting with the Department of Justice today. As for Sununu, Sununu is declarative that candidates, if they're not doing well in polling, should be out by Christmas here. And Donald Trump has welcomed a growing field. And I don't think we should move past, Ryan, the fact that today his former vice president, Mike Pence, formally filed his paperwork, not since Vice President John Nance Garner back in 1940 <laughs> challenged uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt for the presidency. Have we seen uh, this sort of relationship of Vice President challenging his former president, right? This is something that is unusual, but it is the Republican Party in 2023 here. And frankly, the next two months are going to be significant uh, as candidates try to qualify for the debate stage. But we're eight months away from the Iowa caucus. That's not actually that much time. Yeah. It's such a great point. Uh, so many things involving Donald Trump, uh, we just kind of paper over these kind of monumental things. And the right. idea that a, a former running mate would challenge the person uh, that he ran with is pretty astounding. So let's talk about this field. You know, independent of Sunu, we're going to still have 11 candidates this week. Isn't this kind of exactly what Trump was hoping for? This is exactly what he was hoping for. And that, you know, he said last week, uh, well, with Sean Hannity, that uh, he likes the guy that's in ninth and tenth place, right? Because they take shots at the number two or number three candidate who they're trying to eclipse. I want to let you hear a little bit of Asa Hutchinson just this last hour. One of those candidates in this field as he talks and uh, essentially justifies his own uh, inclusion in this field, but also the merits of having a big field here at this point. Take a listen. The fact that three other candidates are jumping in there indicates that there's a wide open lane for a non-Trump candidate. Uh, and whenever you look at the number this year, it's about half of what it was in 2016. So it's a different year. People know Donald Trump. They're going to make their decision. And folks like Asa Hutchinson, Ryan, they're going to be competing with some of these other candidates with one, two, three percent just to get onto the stage. So much of their attention here this summer, it should be on them getting on the debate stage rather than focusing on Donald Trump, the front runner. Yeah, and then they also have to meet that uh, unique donor threshold, which is uh, going to be very difficult for these candidates who are barely right. registering in the polls. All right, Vaughn, excellent report. Thank you, as always. Let's talk about it now with our panel. Eugene Scott, senior politics reporter at Axios. Stephanie Shriak, who is a senior advisor at the Strategic Victory Fund, and Brendan Buck, a former advisor to speakers John Boehner and Paul Ryan, and he's also an NBC News political analyst. So I'm going to pose the same question to you guys that I posed to Vaughn. Eugene, is this big field exactly what Donald Trump wants? It certainly will work for him. We covered 2016 together, and we know that he ran away with uh, an advantage that wasn't the majority, in part, because there were so many people. And, and it's really important to realize that people who weren't that different from one another, and so, like, segments of uh, the primary electorate who would have maybe uh, gotten behind someone, one person, and given Trump a real advantage, didn't, because they were divided between, like, two or three candidates who seemed to, like, tout the same values that they had. Yeah. Stephanie, I always think that in order to even think about running for president, your ego must be massive, right? <laughs> but in an environment like this, where you have someone like Donald Trump who, who sucks up so much of the oxygen, and there's already so many candidates in the race, what's going through the mind of some of these candidates like Doug Burgum and, and Chris Christie? Where's their constituency? Where's their path to victory? Well, I think you heard it from Asa Hutchinson, which is there's this theory that there is a, there's a non-Trump lane open. But the problem is no one's going to be able to come out of that non-Trump lane when Trump is holding 45 to 50 percent in some polls in these. And that will change. They have to attack him. They have to take him down. That's that's going to be the fight here. But this isn't Trump of 2016 who started really nowhere. Right. He starts with a pretty significant floor and he starts with a good fundraising base and people is he gets pressed every day he gets pressed anytime he wants it 
and that's pretty hard to beat. Right, but the other side of that, Brendan, too, is that he also starts this time around with a significant amount of baggage that he didn't have in 2016. Yeah, but actually, I think it's really interesting. Chris Anunu in his, his op-ed there cited a poll that showed Donald Trump only getting 35% of the vote. But it's not hard to look for polls that actually show uh, him beating Joe Biden, or at least very close to Joe Biden. And I think that's a really interesting thing that's going to buoy Donald Trump, is because mm -hmm. the big argument that basically all of them are making at this point is Donald Trump is a loser, he can't get reelected. Right. Well, when you start having these polls that show, well, actually, Joe Biden is really unpopular, and perhaps Donald Trump actually could beat him this time, it lowers the threshold there. Like, there are some people who are like, I like Donald Trump, but I'm worried about him. Well, maybe I don't have to worry about him quite as much right. anymore. Maybe we could make a run at it. That's whole. That's Ron DeSantis' whole argument. If that, that argument goes away, all it does is, is help Donald Trump. Well, you open the door to me talking about what Sununu had to say about Ron DeSantis. He doesn't mention him by name, but this is what he says in the op-ed. We must abandon the issues that are solely made for social media headlines, such as banning books or issuing cur curriculum fiats to local school districts hundreds of miles away from state capitals. We need to expand beyond the culture wars that alienate independence young voters and suburban moms. And Eugene, when I read that, my first thought process was, he might be right about winning a general election, but does he not understand the Republican primary voter? Because it's this set of issues that really seems to fire them up. Indeed, and I'm, and I'm sure he does, but it's something that many of us have been thinking about, like how is DeSantis going to perform in a general? I'm sure we all heard his speech very recently about attacking woke culture. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not something that really appeals to these demographics that, you know, self-identify as swing voters um, and the demographics that he would need to, to beat a Biden, women, suburban voters, uh, these young voters. The, his attacks really are not that popular outside of the GOP base. So, Brendan, when you look at this field, then, which of the candidates most exemplifies the things Sununu is looking for? Um, well, the, Without what, endorsing anyone. Yeah, I'm well, not asking you to do that. No, I mean, look, I still think that it is Donald Trump, Ron DeSantis, and everybody else. Because everybody else is basically acting like this is the party of 10 years ago, when it's it's very clearly not. Right. But I also think it's Ron DeSantis' fault, largely, that we have this large field. Mm -hmm. Ron DeSantis kind of came out on the scene two months ago, or whatever it was, and really showed himself to be a potentially weak candidate. And that's why all of these people think, maybe he's not the Trump alternative. Maybe there is somebody else right. who can fill that space. I don't know that that's really true. I mean... I'm sure Doug Burgum is a nice guy. I'm sure Ryan Nobles has higher name ID than he does. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know exactly what his plan is, but until somebody else can knock any of them off the stage, for as flawed as Ron DeSantis may be in a, in a general election, he knows what plays to base voters. He knows how to get attention, and that's really what you need right now. Yeah. All right, so uh, I want to play off more on this culture issue, Stephanie, and uh, it does seem as though Sununu wants the party to move away from it, but the candidates running seem to understand that that's what motivates their voters. Listen to what Nikki Haley said in a town hall last night. The idea that we have biological boys playing in girls' sports, it is the women's issue of our time. How are we supposed to get our girls used to the fact that biological boys are in their locker rooms? And then we wonder why a third of our teenage girls seriously contemplated suicide last year? We should be growing strong girls, confident girls. So I feel like if we had an AI generator and we took those words and, and put it in with Ron DeSantis's voice, you wouldn't sure. question that at all, right? I mean, it's almost the same exact rhetoric. I, these, these Republican candidates know what they've got to do, and it is it is this culture war in the in the primary. And to your point, you got to win a primary before you get a chance to win a general. Mm -hmm. Like you just, it just that's just how it works. There's no there's no magic way around it, and so they know they've got to get through and pull off a bunch of Trump voters or a bunch of DeSantis voters, and they're going to go after these two guys on this issue. Now, I'll say at the end of the day here, these issues are not what the American public in the general election are going to want to hear. And even just already the, the record of Governor DeSantis in Florida is a terrible record to run on in suburban and exurban America. And mm -hmm. women are not going to like the book banning. They're not going to like the six-week abortion ban, which frankly is one of the worst uh, issues for this entire Republican well, it's Party across the board. It's interesting you point that out because we are showing Nikki Haley, you know, kind of leaning into some of these culture wars, but she is trying to have it both ways on abortion. This is what she said about that last night. Take a listen to that. If a six-week ban theoretically came to your desk, would you sign it? But why? Why? I will answer that 
when you answer, when you ask Kamala and Biden if they would agree to 37 weeks, 38 weeks, 39 weeks, then I'll answer your question. I understand you're saying it's up to the where you can get 60, 60 votes, but in your view, you must have an opinion. Is 15 weeks where it would be, theoretically? I haven't talked to the senators. I don't know where 60 votes are. So, Eugene, it seems this is, she's not the only Republican candidate that struggled with this. It used to be before Roe v. Wade yeah. was overturned, a Republican candidate could just say, I'm pro-life, right. and then kind of hide to a certain extent behind that Supreme Court ruling. Mm -hmm. Now they actually have to take a substantive policy position, mm -hmm. and they have had a very difficult time wading through that, especially with the general election in their future. Indeed, there's real awareness that 2022 did not go the Republicans' way in part because of where the party stood on abortion. And Roe versus Wade really has not been uh, as well received as some of the more conservative Republicans for some reason thought it would be. <laughs> and so individuals are trying to figure out how they can remain competitive and align with where most voters are, uh, but still somehow, you know, get through a primary and not alienate people who would look at some of these restrictive abortion bans and say, this issue alone will keep me from backing you, which they have done, which some voters have done in elections uh, and campaigns even since 2022. Do you think, Brendan, I mean, somebody that's been in Republican politics for a long time, I mean, the idea of being pro-life yeah. in a post-Roe world is a lot different than it was in a pre-Roe world, isn't yeah. it? We never had to really answer that question. It was, it was mm -hmm. the Supreme Court, and then the fight was always about, well, we'll solve this at the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And now the, the issue is that state capitals all across the, the country in different states are all de defining this issue for us. <laughs> you know, they're each picking their own. We, we used to talk about we want some reasonable restrictions, um, and places like Texas and Florida and Georgia are going well beyond what people think are reasonable. I think as a, as a political matter, it's probably best to just kind of pick a line that, where you want it to be, and people will stop asking you about it quite so often, because mm -hmm. if you don't have an answer, they're just going to keep coming at you. They're going to keep having to talk about it. It's not a good, good thing to be talking about. Uh, but it shows the enormous gap between what base Republican voters uh, demand versus what a general election uh, electorate is is going to be looking to see. And that's where we're stuck. And she remains stuck right there. Yeah. And I guess, Stephanie, Democrats are not going to stop talking about it, right? Well, absolutely not, because, you know, to his point, you've got legislatures full bans, legislatures pushing six-week bans. They are in law in some states. They're, they are completely, there's no access in some states. So, so people are feeling it. And on top of it, you're going to have pressure from far right-wing organizations demanding mm -hmm. that these presidential candidates promise that they'll sign a national abortion right. ban. Mm -hmm. You're going to have Senate candidates and House candidates promising national abortion bans, just like they did last time. They're going to have to answer that question right. while dealing with a far-right religious uh, sect inside of the party. That's pretty powerful, particularly in places like Iowa. Right. Those advocacy organizations have a direct line to the high-frequency primary voters that pick mm -hmm. presidential candidates. Terrific conversation, guys. Eugene, Stephanie, Brendan, I appreciate you all being here. Thank you so much. Coming up, Trump's attorneys spotted at the Department of Justice today amid new developments in the special counsel investigation into the former president's handling of classified documents. We'll have the very latest next. Plus, U.S. and Chinese officials meet in Beijing amid escalating tensions and increasingly provocative moves by the Chinese military. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. The former president's lawyers were seen today at the Justice Department. NBC News has confirmed that they were meeting with Justice Department officials that did not include Attorney General Merrick Garland or Deputy AG Lisa Monaco. It comes as the grand jury investigating Mr. Trump's handling of classified documents found at Mar-a-Lago is expected to meet again. NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delaney joins me now from the DOJ. So, Ken, do we know why Trump's attorneys were at the Justice Department today? Not specifically, Ryan. Neither side is describing the contents of the meeting or the nature of the meeting. But it's very common for lawyers of a defendant to come in and try to talk the Justice Department out of charging their client in a high profile case. That happens all the time. And there's every reason to believe that's what's going on here amid the other evidence that the uh, investigation in the documents case appears to be wrapping up and coming to a close. So. You, you maybe expand on that a little bit. Does it mean that we could be getting close to a decision on an indictment? This meeting, plus the other evidence that we're seeing, which is that, uh, for example, the grand jury in this case uh, went dormant for the last month or so, it appears. And then now we're reporting in NBC News that they are poised to meet again 
this week. Um, so that it's possible that they could be meeting to vote on an indictment uh, of President Trump. We don't know that for sure. Um, that's one of the possibilities. Grand juries are secret. They're unpredictable. But um, we do know that they've the grand jury has heard testimony from almost every conceivable witness who had any connection to the cl classified documents, the movement of those documents at Mar-a-Lago, including, you know, more than a dozen staff members at Mar-a-Lago. So it really does feel like they're reaching the end and we're getting signals that, that you know, a charging decision is imminent. So when they get to that final stage, maybe describe what happens in that grand jury room. Do they take a vote? How, how is it decided then that an indictment's going to be handed down? Well, there's an old saying that a prosecutor could convince a grand jury to indict a ham sandwich. So it's not, it's not a high drama situation like, you know, a murder case in 12 Angry Men, but there, there would be a vote. And then they would go in and tell the judge, uh, you know, sort of report to the judge that they've uh, turned in what's known as a true bill, uh, an indictment. And then um, generally in, in, the, in D.C., that indictment would go under seal and it would be unsealed only when the defendant, in this case, Donald Trump, makes a first appearance in court. So after that indictment um, was voted on and judge, they tell the judge it goes to the clerk's office in D.C., then the prosecutors would be, begin making arrangements for Donald Trump to surrender and turn himself in in Washington, D.C., and make a first appearance in court. And that's when likely we would see the charges and the nature of the indictment. So, and I would imagine that when and if that happens, we should be clear if it happens, it will be similar to the circus that we saw in New York when he was indicted by the Manhattan district attorney. Is there a chance that he wouldn't have to appear in person? Is it uh, required that you have to appear in person at the federal level? How does that process work? It's a great question. It's not required, but it's almost always done. But, you know, the pandemic sort of created some new precedents. So there were a lot of virtual first appearances and arraignments during the pandemic. So it is possible. It's theoretically possible that uh, if he's indicted, he could make a first appearance via video conference. He's in uh, Bedminster, New Jersey right now at his property there. But generally, prosecutors like I'd like the defendant to appear in court and there's some things that they have to sign and some things they have to work out with the probation office. Um, so we'll have to see. It's likely that it'll appear. You're right. Uh, we could expect, we would expect a, a very circus-like atmosphere if that happens. Okay. Ken Delanian, staying on top of it. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Turning now from the Justice Department to the Defense Department, which just, which just released this video showing a close encounter between a U.S. Navy destroyer and a Chinese warship in the Taiwan Strait over the weekend. According to the Pentagon, the Chinese ship came within just 150 yards of the American ship, forcing it to slow its course to avoid a collision. China is defending its actions, claiming the strait is part of its economic zone and not international waters. The incident comes just a week after a Chinese fighter jet flew directly in front of the nose of a U.S. reconnaissance plane over the South China Sea. But despite these confrontations, a State Department official says that diplomats from the U.S. and China have had candid and productive discussions today in Beijing. NBC's Courtney Kuby joins me now from the Pentagon. So, Courtney, what is China's defense for these provocative moves? So China maintains that, in fact, the U.S. exercising flying sailing in these areas is the provocation. That's the provocative move and that the Chinese military is in fact responding to the U.S. provocation. Of course, the U.S., as you would imagine, Ryan, completely denies that. So in the case of these, this dis U.S. destroyer over the weekend in the Taiwan Strait, which, by the way, was exercising with a Canadian military ship, uh, the U.S. maintains that that is international waterways and they have every right to sail through that area. In the case of the, the recent incident between the U.S. surveillance plane, the RC-135, and the Chinese military jet, which flew directly in front of that U.S. surveillance plane, well, the Chinese maintain that over the South China Sea, that is not international airspace. And they also say that the area in the South China Sea is, is there, some of that is their territorial water. But that's the exact reason that the U.S. continues to fly and continues to sail in these areas. It's to try to break down that Chinese argument that they have gained some sort of territorial claim on this area. And we heard that exact argument out of the White House at the briefing today from John Kirby. Here's what he had to say. No call for that. Uh, it's unsafe. It's unprofessional. We're flying or sailing or operating in international airspace and international waters. And both of those incidents were in, com in co uh, complete compliance with international law. There was absolutely no need for the PLA to act as aggressively as they did. When you have pieces of metal 
that size, whether it's in the air or on the sea, and they're operating that close together, uh, it wouldn't take much for an error in judgment or a mistake to get made and somebody could get hurt. The U.S. maintains that China is trying to change international norms by claiming that some of these areas are their territorial waters or their airspace. And the U.S., by, by doing these freedom of navigation operations, is trying to break down the Chinese, the Chinese efforts to ch essentially change the law, Ryan. Hmm. So is the U.S. considering any kind of formal response? Does the Pentagon feel any pressure to respond to China in something like this? Not at this point, and certainly not from a, the military perspective. What they're trying to do is get the Chinese to talk. So what we, we saw the, um, earlier, uh, early last month in early May, the Pentagon asked the Chinese Minister of Defense to sit down and meet with Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. Both were scheduled to be in Singapore late last week for this annu annual uh, defense conference. Well, several days before they both departed for, the, for Singapore, China declined the invitation. The two men had a very brief encounter. They shook hands at a dinner. They exchanged some very brief pleasantries, but that was really it. The, the Pentagon continues to ask China to sit down and talk. The big concern is that when you have incidents like this that have the potential to be very dangerous, that without a line of communication, it only exacerbates the situation, Ryan. All right, now to the topic that all my neighborhood dads uh, want no answers to, and that's the topic that was blowing up all of our text chains this week. Uh, folks in D.C. hearing a loud sonic boom yesterday. What's the Pentagon saying about this? Yeah, so what happened is that there was actually this tragic event where this uh, a Cessna, a private plane, uh, the pilot went unresponsive. Well, as is very standard, when you have a, a plane that is operating off of its, 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 its charted path or a pilot that's not responding repeatedly, NORAD scrambled a number of F-16 fighter jets. The first two left out of Andrews Air Force Base yesterday. And, and, um, and because they had to catch up with that plane very quickly, they were authorized to fly at a supersonic speed. Well, what we all learned here in the D.C. area yesterday is what that means is, uh, not to get too technical and scientific here, but when the, when the plane is flying so fast, it's literally faster than the speed of sound, all these molecules essentially build up around the plane. They all sort of come together and they create this almost, almost like an explosion. That's what it sounds like. It sounds like thunder. Sometimes if you're close enough, it can feel like an earthquake. It's called a sonic boom. But we're not used to hearing them around here, frankly, because it's very uncommon that, that U.S. military aircraft will be flying at a supersonic speed over in the U.S., in this case, though, in order to catch up with the plane, they were authorized to do so. They did catch up with it. They even fired off some flares to try to alert the pilot. It became very clear, according to officials who we've spoken with, that the pilot was unresponsive. And tragically, the plane crashed about two hours after the, the first call to try to, to get in touch with that pilot, and everyone on board died. It, a very sad end to that, but it was definitely a curiosity for many people in our neck of the woods, for sure. I did not hear the sonic boom. I... Uh, it's, uh, I feel a little left out from that pro perspective. But Courtney QB, thank you so much for your reporting. We appreciate it. Thanks. Up next, with Washington's debt deal finally done, what's Congress cooking up next? House Democrat Jared Moskowitz will join me next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. And we're back. After weeks of negotiations to raise the country's debt ceiling, Congress and the White House prove that when push comes to shove, Washington can still get things done. But with the threat of a disastrous default behind them now, you might say that we're entering something of a silly season on Capitol Hill, where we see bills that aren't aimed so much as becoming laws as they are aimed at sending a message, like an expected vote in the House tomorrow on a Republican bill that would prevent the government from banning gas stoves. This despite the White House saying that there is no plan to ban gas stoves. And joining me now on set to talk more about this is the Democratic Congressman from Florida, Congressman Jared Moskowitz. Congressman, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. Let's talk about the debt ceiling first, and then we'll get to gas stoves. Sure. I know you have a lot of interest. Right, in both that. issues that are on the same <laughs> wavelength. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, so from your perspective, and, and I talked to you quite a bit uh, throughout this process, and you seem to have a pretty middle-of-the-road sense of all of this. Uh, was, were, were there any winners and losers here? Did the speaker come out on top? Did the president come out on top? What's your sense of it? Well, first of all, the winner was the American people. Uh, because at the end of the day, we did not default, which I think would have been catastrophic. It would have been catastrophic for the American people. It would have been catastrophic for the world economy. It would have hurt the dollar and compared to the yen and, and made China a winner. So I think the American people were really the winners at the end of the day. You know, as far as the, the political politics, I mean, listen, obviously the speaker, you know, worked on a bill. He negotiated a bill that a lot of his party 
voted against. I think the president did a really good job on getting that two-year raise on the debt ceiling, because the idea of a debt ceiling in the middle of a presidential election, uh, I mean, that would have just been politicized to the 10th degree. And I really do think at that point, point default would have been possible, because the default would have been used mm -hmm. as a weapon to hurt someone in an election. Mm -hmm. You know, as far as, you know, what else is, I'm, I'm happy we negotiated. I always felt that, that that's where it was headed anyway. Right. right. I've always been a believer that both sides should always be talking. This idea that we shouldn't be talking and shouldn't be meeting. But at the end of the day, I think the American people were the real winner. All right. You said uh, you plan on using the debt ceiling actually in your campaign messaging. This is something that you said in Axios. Uh, Mo Moskowitz, who just won by five points in 2022, says he does plan to incorporate the debt ceiling into his campaign message, arguing that a vote for Democrats is a vote for normalcy on the issue. And you said we already had Donald Trump saying live on CNN that the U.S. should default. Imagine what he would say in January or February or March of the next year. Do you think your voters are paying attention to the debt ceiling, that they know what's going on, that that's something you can use as a pitch to them to see you reelected in the next campaign? Well, look, obviously, thankfully, we didn't see like a decrease in our credit rating mm -hmm. like we saw uh, 10 years ago. So I don't know that they were paying attention to it as much this time as they, we were, they were last time. Quite frankly, Washington has cried wolf a right, lot on right. the debt ceiling, right. so possibly people tune it out. But I will say, I, w I was concerned when I see a, a former president of the United States saying we should default as if somehow the United States would just go to bankruptcy court, which is what that president is used to. <laughs> Imagine what he would say a year from now, exactly my point, weaponizing you know, the full faith and credit of, of the United States. So what I am going to say to my voters, is what I did say before, is what you saw in the midterm election. I was elected in the midterm election where Democrats did a lot better than everybody thought. It's because I am pushing normal. I am pushing sanity. I am pushing logic. Uh, it's enough of all the noise. I mean, we're not going to govern via Twitter. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about what's next. The debt ceiling is passed. You do obviously have some spending bills that you have to deal with in the very near future. Uh, is this culture of bipartisanship something that can continue, or are we going to be in another crisis mode in September worried that the government's going to run out of money to pay its bills. Well, as a former emergency management director, I can tell you that this place works from crisis to crisis. <laughs> I notice it because I, I, I've, I feel comfortable, unfortunately, while, while it's happening because I'm yeah. used to that. Uh, I do think, however, that we did show the American people that the adults in the room can get together and make a deal. Uh, and that's Republicans and Democrats getting together and making a deal that to the benefit of the American people and again to, to the world economy. But look, there are forces on both sides that, you know, would like to see us just, you know, fight. And if we don't get 100 percent of what we want, make no deal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is this is this new for the culture to come? I mean, Republicans had been together on everything for about the first five and a half months. Now it's a real test to see what happens with the Freedom Caucus. Do they try to pull away and, and cause chaos in Congress? I mean, would it, should it be a message to the Freedom Caucus that 149 Republicans voted for this bill when they think about something like a motion to vacate, that Kevin McCarthy seems to have the vast majority of his party behind him? Well, listen, let me, let me say this to the Freedom Caucus. There is no way, at least myself and I'm sure many other Democrats, are going to turn the power over to the Freedom Caucus. Mm -hmm. So anything that they propose to try to throw the House into chaos, I'm not going to support that. That's interesting. Would it go as far as cutting a deal with Kevin McCarthy to, for a few Democrats to fill that gap to allow him to stay in the speakership? Well, look, I, I'll leave that up to my leadership to negotiate. But what I can tell you is if the Freedom Caucus comes forward, the idea that we would aid the Freedom Caucus and give more power to them is something that I can't consider. Okay, interesting. All right, so let's talk about this uh, vote tomorrow on a bill that protects gas stoves. You have a tongue-in-cheek amendment. I, I think it's at least a tongue-in-cheek amendment. I'm trying to put the issue on the front burner. Yeah, that would uh, create the establishment of a gas stove czar. I mean, are you a little concerned that you're just contributing to the culture wars with an amendment like this? Or, I mean, what's your point here? What are you trying to establish? Well, look, I, this is silly, right? This is completely silly. A week after we just did the debt ceiling and made sure America didn't default, through my, my colleagues across the aisle come not with just one, but two bills on the war on gas stoves, as somehow General Electric is fighting the, the war on, on gas stoves. No one's trying to ban gas stoves. We, we have appliances. Everyone can get a gas stove if they want to get a gas stove. If you have a gas stove, you can keep your gas stove. But we have regulations on all appliances. Just we have regulations on cars. They're energy standards. And the Republicans have turned this into some sort of culture war thing. They are prioritizing this. And as someone who's from Parkland, someone who graduated Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, the idea that six months 
in the Congress in, you know, gun awareness prevention month. You know, we're doing gas stoves. We've not had one hearing on school safety. We've not had one hearing on gun violence. The last thing I, I haven't heard of any gas stoves walking into, into any schools and, and taking out 17 children. And so I just think that this is totally ridiculous. And yes, I'm using levity to point out the ridiculousness of what they're doing. Okay. All right. Congressman Jared Moskowitz, I appreciate it. Always uh, look forward to your assessment of things. And we've got a lot more to talk about as the year goes on. Thanks, Thank Congressman. You. Appreciate you being here. And after the break, lawmakers aren't the only ones recalibrating after the debt limit deal. New reporting on how President Biden plans to pitch 2024 voters on his bipartisan record. Will it work? That's next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. And welcome back. Fresh off a big bipartisan win on the debt ceiling, President Biden is ready to pivot back to his reelection campaign. NBC's Mike Memoli reports that it's a, quote, return to previously scheduled programming, according to a White House senior advisor. The president hopes to showcase himself as a leader willing to reach across the aisle and build consensus, while his Republican rivals spar with each other on the campaign trail. I'm joined by Amy Walter, the publisher and editor-in-chief of the Cook Political Report. Uh, and uh, Amy, our own Mike Memoli reports that the president is not planning on taking a victory lap here on the debt deal. But should he? I mean, I, I, I was struck during these negotiations that he really doesn't have a serious primary challenge. We're going to get to that in yeah, a yeah. second. But it's a lot different than the Republican candidates that need to really impress upon their base voters. The president here can start... Uh, touting a general election message, which might mean showing he can cut a bipartisan deal. That's right. He did a little bit of a victory lap. Maybe we'll call it, I don't know, a half a lap or <laughs> something. A, a Friday night uh, televised address right, right. to the public about working together mm -hmm. in a bipartisan way to solve this crisis. And certainly he was able to get some of the themes that we'll see on the campaign trail there as well, right? Keeping the economy going strong, keeping his top priorities from being gutted. Um, but you're exactly right, Ryan. It's sort of fascinating to me that you have a president who campaigned on returning to normal, mm -hmm. being somebody who could work with Congress, somebody who could reach across the aisle, and not just on the debt ceiling he's proven this, but on things like, as we know, the CHIPS Act right. and on infrastructure, on a gun bill, right? There are plenty of places where he's been able to do it, and yet his approval ratings are still somewhere in the low 40% range. Mm -hmm. And even among Democrats, you don't hear a tremendous amount of enthusiasm mm -hmm. around the idea of him running for a second term. I think so much of this goes back to a couple of things. One, the fact is there's one thing he can't do anything about, and that's how old he is. Right, right. So you can cut all the deals that you want. What people first see when they see Joe Biden is the image of mm -hmm. who he is and what he looks like. And the second is, I think what a victory looks like for many Democratic voters, especially younger voters, are the things that he campaigned on that he's been unable to follow through on. Student loan mm -hmm. debt, uh, for example, or DACA. Things like this that have been on the table for years and years and years, haven't been able to get through. And finally, your own poll back in April, I thought, tells the whole story of the challenge for Joe Biden. When, when asked of what when voters were asked to say who they voted for in the last election and why, uh, people said they voted for Biden. Half of them said they voted for Biden because they liked him and the other half voted for him because they didn't like Donald right. Trump. Right. And, and that leads me to my next topic is that that is a big part of Joe right. Biden's appeal is yeah. that he's not Donald Trump. That's right. Uh, and we're already starting to see some scuttle about challenges to him. You know, we have RFK Jr. who's out there doing something. But also today, Cornell West just announced a third party bid. I covered Bernie Sanders in 2019 and 2020. So I was around Cornell West quite a bit. He's somebody with a, a, a strong base That's of right. support that people connect with. You know, RFK Jr. as high as 20 percent in some of these polls. Do either of these men threaten Joe Biden's appeal that he's not Donald Trump and that effort as he tries to coalesce that not Donald Trump vote. Right. So they both can I mean, they appeal to different constituencies, but mm -hmm. the idea, especially among some of these voters who turned out only to vote against Donald Trump, these other two candidates may be a reason to vote for something, mm -hmm. right, rather than just a vote against something. But I think for 
the general election, the challenge for Democrats, for Biden, what you hear, I'm sure you hear as well, I hear from Democrats, their number one concern is third party candidates. Right. Um, we Which saw it in 2016, and that's what Cornell West yeah, would right. be. He doesn't need to get on the ballot in 50 states. Three, he only needs, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just get on Wisconsin and Arizona and Georgia, right. that and pull one or two percent. Mm -hmm. That could be enough to make um, Biden's success right. there really tenuous. We all remember we Ralph all, Nader's role in 2000, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know, Jill Stein and yes, et, right. et cetera. Now, it's different. Obviously, these are different candidates. It's a different right. time. But we know how narrow those margins are going to be right. regardless of what the campaign ultimately So looks what like. do you make of RFK? He, this is somebody, RFK Jr., Jr. we should be very clear yes, about. Yes. Known for his conspiracy theories, he was very passionately anti-vaccine. Um, we know that he has connections to Steve Bannon, but he does have the last name Kennedy. That's right. Uh, my what, what my number one question yeah. is how soon or when will we see Democratic affiliated groups going out and educating Democratic voters about who RFK Jr. is. Right now, he's as high as he is in the polls because it's just all name ID. I doubt right. very many people know much about him. Right. So when will we start to see sort of a sustained campaign highlighting many of the things you just did about some of the conspiracy theories and the anti-vaccine and the support from Steve Bannon uh, to probably drive that, uh, that support down? But look, when you've got, I don't know, we've seen multiple polls about this, anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of Democrats saying, boy, I'd like another option right, in 2024. Right. We, sh we shouldn't be that surprised that somebody with a very well-known name is getting some of that vote. You know, it's always interesting that these candidates that are established, they decide not to entertain a primary challenger. And I'm not saying that this is going to happen this time around, but, you know, when Hillary Clinton thought she was just going to ride to the right. nomination and Bernie Sanders came in, sometimes a little bit of competition strengthens it, it the primary. It is good. And, and to really make your case yeah. to voters about why you are the best candidate, not just why this person is not good. Right, right. All right. No. Amy Walter, uh, excellent analysis as always. We appreciate you being here. Welcome. Now let's turn to Davenport, Iowa, where, where there are new developments in that deadly building collapse. City officials announced this morning that three bodies have been removed from the scene in the last 48 hours. Brendan Colvin, Sr., Ryan Hitchcock, and Daniel Preen have all been recovered, completing the search for victims one week after sections of the building crumbled to the ground. The news also coincides with new legal action. The first of what could be many lawsuits was filed today by a building resident. That complaint, issue, the, the complaint I should say, accuses the city, the building's owners, and the engineers and contractors who worked on the building of knowing the structure was failing, but intentionally keeping tenants in the dark despite there being a, quote, imminent danger to their lives. In total, nine people were rescued and three were killed as a result of the collapse. And up next, a Trump-appointed federal judge just threw out Tennessee's first-in-the-nation ban on drag shows, calling it, quote, unconstitutional. You're watching Meet the Press Now. And welcome back. In the newest episode of Meet the Press Reports, Chuck Todd takes a look at the art of the con, diving into the stories behind some of America's most prominent modern-day grifters, and how famous figures like Elizabeth Holmes, San Bankman Freed, and Congressman George Santos were able to successfully scam people for so long. Take a look. Elizabeth Holmes, the founder of blood testing startup Theranos, was once worth four and a half billion dollars and celebrated as a woman who could own the future. You founded this company 12 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Tell them how old you were. I was 19. <laughs> So this is the little tubes that we collect the, the samples in. We call them the nanotainer. Um, they're about this big. You get the same results that you get through Theranos if, in fact, you went to a doctor and had him take a vial of blood from your veins. We do. But in 2015, the Wall Street Journal began unraveling the con, questioning whether Theranos' technology worked. This is what happens when you work to change things. And... First they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. At the end of May, Holmes reported to prison after being sentenced to more than 11 years for defrauding investors, including media mogul Rupert Murdoch, Oracle's Larry Ellison, and the Walton family, founders of Walmart. It kind of 
throws into question like the success of some successful people who we might resent for being successful. Hey, famous people are just like us. I can get scammed, so can they. Right. Grifters thrive in the margins, and their unlikely success, pulling the wool over the eyes of the rich, powerful and well-connected until a dramatic fall, is a dark expression of the American dream. Almost 14 years to the day after Bernie Madoff was arrested and charged with fraud in New York for orchestrating a $65 billion Ponzi scheme, Sam Bankman Free, the founder of the cryptocurrency exchange FTX, was charged. He faces 13 counts, including securities fraud, money laundering, and campaign finance violations. Were you truthful with us today? I, I was as truthful as, as I, as, you know, I'm knowledgeable to be. There's, there's, there's some things I wish I knew more about, but yes, I was. So let me ask you this. Do you agree that over time you also lied? Do I believe, do I agree that I lied? I don't know of times when I lied. The full episode of Meet the Press Report's Grifter Nation is available to stream right now on Peacock or YouTube. And we have an update now to a story that we first brought you in another recent Meet the Press Report's episode on the rise of drag bans and anti-drag extremism in the United States. Drag queens in Tennessee can celebrate pride this month without the shadow of the state's looming drag ban after a federal judge rejected a law aimed at severely limiting drag performances late Friday night. The first of its kind law was signed into law by Governor Bill Lee in March and was aimed at banning drag performances in all public places and anywhere with children present. The same federal judge who temporarily blocked the ban back in March before it was set to go into effect ruled against the law entirely on Friday, writing, quote, the ban is both unconstitutionally vague and substantially overbroad. The blocked law is just one of over 500 introduced in state legislatures around the country aimed at regulating the freedom of the LGBTQ community. NBC's Antonia Hilton reported on that story for Meet the Press Reports, and she joins me now. So, Antonia, what does this really mean for drag performers and the overall LGBTQ community in Tennessee right now? What are you hearing for some, from some of these uh, drag queens and other performers that you talked to while you reported on the ban last month? Well, Ryan, I got the chance to talk with some of them over the weekend as they reacted to this news. It came out very late Friday night, so these were texts coming in on Saturday as people were waking up in the morning. And there was this feeling of relief, but also, you know, as one performer put it to me, a concern about complacency. You know, it's pride. People want to celebrate. They want to go to parades. They want to go to dance parties out in the summertime and not be worried about being arrested under this law. But at the same time, as you just mentioned, there's a whole host of other laws that would impact LGBTQ people, not just in Tennessee, but around the country. But to take Tennessee, you know, as the example here, uh, they've passed a ban on gender affirming health care for transgender children. Children. Uh, they've worked on bills to allow teachers to deny using students' uh, pronouns um, and other bills that have to do with access to public space, like bathrooms. And so the communities there still feel like they're under attack. So they feel like this is a initial and, and uh, certainly a celebratory victory for them, but that they're still in the midst of a fight in a state like Tennessee. You mentioned that fight. Uh, the court said the ban was unconstitutional because it was too broad and too vague. So is the Tennessee state government going to respond? Will they just craft legislation that has a bit more specificity to it? Well, in terms of legislation, we'll keep an eye on what they do next. But we know that they have already responded. Uh, Senator Jack Johnson, the Senate Majority Leader there, uh, who I actually st spent time with as part of our Meet the Press reports uh, reporting, uh, he immediately released a statement uh, with his disappointment, saying that this was a win for people uh, who want children to be exposed to sexually explicit content. You know, this goes back to what we've heard from lawmakers, from activists around the country, who've argued that drag uh, requires these kinds of restrictions because it was inherently sexual and threatening to children. But I should point out, this judge was a Trump-appointed judge. You know, this is not a judge who has a reputation for being extra liberal. Um, and in fact, the 
performers uh, and folks who, who wanted to perform drag were nervous about what was going to happen as they move forward with this lawsuit. Um, and what we've seen is some of the Republicans who I've spoken to uh, upset uh, that this judge uh, didn't have their back on this issue. And so I think it could look like further legislation, uh, perhaps in the next session. But we already know that they're going to be pushing the attorney general there to appeal to the Sixth Circuit. Okay, Antonia Hilton, thank you so much. We appreciate that report. And before we go, I want to take a moment to celebrate the big announcement here at Team Meet the Press this weekend. After nearly 10 years, Chuck will be stepping down from Meet the Press at the end of the summer and passing the baton to Kristen Welker, who will be the new moderator. Chuck will become NBC's chief political analyst. So congratulations to both of my friends and colleagues. Chuck's done a tremendous amount for me over the course of my career, so I'm very happy for him. Super excited for Kristen. We're all looking forward to an exciting new chapter in the storied history of Meet the Press. And that does it for this hour. We're back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. But NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.